Welcome to Malan Azad's National Urdu University's Global Classroom. This lesson is based on paper four of the first MA English program. So today we will be concerned with consonants. Let's begin by trying to locate consonants in the total system of sounding resources in English. So if you think about it in terms of how you articulate sounds in English, we're talking about the way it's in the body from the diaphragm, sort of below what you can see, up to the resonant chambers above your noses. So where are consonants located in the sound system of English? Think about if you hear a stream of sound, where do you get the consonants? What's the sound stream made up of? Well, in the pattern of sound, you have different things going on, and this is what makes it interesting and also a little bit complex. In a sense, the highest unit of the sound, where the sound patterns come in, is a unit of melody or of intonation, tone. This is what we call the tone group. And that's a snatch of sound, stream of sound, where you control the pitch movements, intonation. Now, tone groups consist of feet. Feet are units of rhythm. So that is where the natural rhythm, the beat, in the sound comes in. So the melody then is not made up of a number of beats. And these units of rhythm, the feet, in turn are made up of what you know, what you're well known to you as syllables. But what are syllables? Well, syllables are articulatory movements. Articulatory movements where, for example, you move your tongue from one position to another, okay, as in au. Okay? So syllables are things like la, 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 da, 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 for example. Now these are nonsense syllables in English or any other language, but they illustrate the syllable as a kind of dance of the tongue and other articulators, a movement from one position to another. That's the function of the syllable, to sort of choreograph, to organize this movement. Syllables then are the domain of articulation. And syllables, in turn, consist of the units of sound, what we know technically as phonemes. So syllable is some sequence of phonemes, minimally a single phoneme. Now in languages like English and Urdu, for example, a minimal syllable consisting of just one sound, one phoneme, that would typically be a vowel. But there are some languages where you might even have a consonant. Now we'll get back to vowels and consonants. So when you think about the overall system of sound, you can say the tone and rhythm, so within the tone group and the foot, these are the prosodic features of the language. And you will all come across the term prosody, for example, in the discussion of poetry. Whereas the other two units, the syllable and the phoneme, these are units of articulation, where you coordinate the articulation. So the overall sound patterns, when you listen to somebody, is a combination of these prosodic features, the melody, the rhythm, and then the articulatory sequence. So syllables and phonemes, then, are concerned with articulation. And if we're thinking about phonemes, then the two basic types are consonant and vowels. So syllables are typically some pattern uh, uh, with consonants and vowels making them up. As I said, la, 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 da, da, da. And you can listen to something longer, for example, this nonsense word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, from Mary Poppins, right? And you can hear the alternation of consonants and vowels in making up the articulation uh, coordinated as syllables. Let me take one example. This is, comes from a piece of drama uh, called Spring and Port Wine. And it's a simple instruction around the dinner table. So somebody requests the passing of a sauce to go with the fish, a uh, well-known English tartar sauce, spelled here in the French way. So pass the tartar sauce. Now, on the one hand then, pass the tartar sauce is a melody. And if you listen to it, pass the tartar sauce. So you feel, you hear the pitch movement going down. But within this melody, you also have a rhythm. Pass the ta-ta sauce. So there are three feet here. 
and each foot starts with a beat. Pasta, tata, sauce. And then these feet are in turn made up of syllables, right? So you have the syllable pass, the, ta, ta, sauce. And then within these syllables, that's where you find the consonants contributing to the pattern of sounds. P, s, z, t, t, s, s. So you see the syllables then are this alternation between consonants that more or less constrict the airflow and vowels that open up the airflow. Let's look at this just to get a sense of consonants in English in terms of languages around the world. So just a few comments to place uh, English consonants in the environment of other languages. Now, so it's important for you to think about this in terms of what we might call the human sounding potential. So all of us, all humans, we have the same sounding potential. So we have the same brains for organizing the sound, but we also have the same vocal tracts uh, and so on uh, in sound production. And we have the same ears. All of this is the shared human sounding potential. So that's the same human potential for articulating sounds, but also for listening to sounds, perceiving sounds. Now, the human po sounding potential is quite extensive. And that's, as I said, is general to all of us. But then in particular languages, what you find a particular language, a particular language draws on this general human sounding potential. So, for example, Urdu or English or Telugu or, or Nahuatl or Akan or any of the 6,900 plus languages spoken around the world today, they draw on the, on the general sounding potential in different ways. So when we refer to the sound system of English, of Urdu, and so on, what we refer to is how these languages use the general resources uh, at our disposal in making sounds. So only one part, one particular subpart of the overall human potential is used in a particular language. And the challenge for us when we learn a new language, when we move into a new language, and when we teach a new language, is sort of to access that general human potential uh, that is some kind of background to the particular language languages we speak. And as you help students learning English, for example, what you have to do is help them access that part of the human sounding potential uh, that lies beyond what they're accustomed to in speaking Urdu, for example, or Telugu, or any other language that is their mother tongue. Now, if you think about languages around, uh, around the world and you ask how many consonants have they got, okay? That's an interesting question, and let me just say a couple of words about it. This map that you're looking at now is t t taken from something called the World Atlas of Language Structures, and it had lots of information. Now, one very prominent phonetician, uh, uh, Ian Madison, he's created various maps having to do with consonants, vowels, syllables, and so on. And here you see a map of consonants, and it's just indicating the size of the consonant inventory. So how many consonants do you have operating in that language? Now, if you look at the location of English, which is represented here by the traditional uh, pre-colonial uh, location of English, so Old English, uh, British English, then you see a sort of average. And then you glance down on samples taken from India, and you see, on the whole, average consonant inventories. So no big difference here. If you zoom in on India, so we look now on the map that includes a magnified India, right? Uh, you can see that among the languages here, then Hindi, and the same would be true of Urdu, so this is, represents both, has a large consonant inventory. So one difference between English and Hindi-Urdu is that the consonant in inventory in Urdu is larger than that of English. And one difference, for example, in these is that in Urdu, but not in English, you have a number of consonants where when you pronounce them, you roll back the tip of your tongue. So you have, for example, lurke, right, where you have a retroflex in technical terms. Are. So tip of the tongue back. Now this is a human potential, but it's not used in English. Just a little bit on the uh, different uh, sort of remarkable features. So in English and Urdu and Telugu and so on, are common consonants absent? And the answer is no. Okay? So in this map, you can see it represents 
consonants, uh, languages around the world where common consonants are absent. And you see all the white dots, these represent languages where common consonants are not absent. And so this is true both of Hindi and Urdu, for example. Okay? So nothing to worry about in English in this respect. But let's look at the opposite, so presence of uncommon consonants. Okay? So again, a map of the world, but you see the pattern is a little bit different here. In languages spoken in India, in the sample, so it doesn't represent all of them, you see there are no languages with a presence of uncommon consonants. Okay? So all the consonants you tend to find in Indian languages are common enough around the languages of the world. Okay? But then you can look at England again, so Old English, I mean in the sense of the original English, and you see this is a language with uncommon consonants. And what are these? Well, it's th, th, right? So the fricatives that we know that some learners of English as a foreign language have difficulties with. So, for example, we know the Germans learning English have considerable difficulties with this. So th often turns into z, for example. Why? Well, because German does not utilize, does not employ the human potential to articulate this th or th. So that's something to take note of in English. If you look further around the language of the world, then you see there is a little group of languages in south, in southern part of Africa that have a very specialized kind of sound. These are known as click sounds, and the languages are largely members of the Khoisan family of languages. What are click sounds? Well, click sounds are sounds that you find in English, in fact, but not in the English sound system. So in English, if you don't like what somebody says, you might say, right, disapproving. But this is not, in fact, part of ordinary English words. Okay? So say, try to say, for example, uh, take using, try that for yourselves. It's not so easy, is it? And the reason it's not so easy is that it's not actually part of the English sound system, even though sort of on the fringes of English we use them. Another example would be, we use that, for example, to encourage the horse to make, move, move forward. These are click sounds. So in languages in south, southern part of Africa, you have a number of click sounds. Okay. <laughs> So this is an example of click sounds, uh, and there are languages with a very, very rich inventory of click sounds. Now it's useful to try this out, and I'll explain why I think it's useful to try it out. Now again, if we go back to this notion of the general human sounding potential, right, we can all produce click sounds, and the question is simply if a particular language has utilized that, utilized that potential to produce click sounds. Now, one way of learning through uh, about consonants is what I like to call phonetic yoga. Now, what is yoga? Well, it's many things. But if you think about physical yoga, hatha yoga, it's the ability to sort of uh, make the body more flexible. Now, it has higher level purposes, but just think about that in hatha yoga. So it's the ability to make the body more flexible uh, and to adopt new positions. Now that's precisely what I'm recommending, right? So in exploring your human sounding potential, right? And in engaging with English, for example, and in helping your students engage with English, then you can encourage this uh, activity of phonetic yoga. So for example, you can try click sounds, like in one language uh, spoken in South Africa, that's osa, osa, right? spelled XH. Now that begins with the click sound. So you can practice uh, pronouncing uh, words with click sounds, for example. But try out other things. Okay? Try out other things with consonants. So for example, just get a sense of your own bodies and switch. Try some difference in position and try just changing one position at a time. So for example, between S, Z, right? So you can start pronouncing S, and then you switch on your vibration of the vocal cords. Now that's an example of phonetic yoga. Now, get a sense of how you produce this. So put your fingers on your Adam's apple to feel your vocal cords. So say 
and that you get a feeling of the onset of the vibration when you say z and how the vibration disappears when you switch, switch to s. Okay? So this is something that is useful to explore and the, the point is you sort of go beyond uh, what you're familiar with in your mother tongue or other languages you speak and you encourage your students to become, become familiar with what I call the uh, human articulatory potential. Now I'm thinking about English consonants, right? There are different ways we can describe them. And let me just say something about this because then again this is important in understanding but exploring and getting a sense of the consonants. And all these what I call descriptive angles and consonants are helpful in enabling, empowering your students uh, to get them right in spoken English. So you can think about the consonants in different orders. Of course, when you meet the consonants, we'll the tartar sauce. as in this example, let's take it again. We'll the tartar sauce. You can think about it in different ways. One way of thinking about it is purely physical terms, right? The sound waves that hit our ears. And this is, of course, what we talk about in acoustic phonetics. So phonetics, describing, looking at, attending to sounds in terms of their acoustic properties, the sound waves. But you can also think about them in biological terms, and that is then in terms of the human body, right? So this is what we talk about in articulatory phonetics. That is when we try to describe, we try to get a sense of the consonants in terms of how you articulate them. And this is, of course, where phonetic yoga comes in, right? So you try to get a sense between the difference between d, d, right? And pay attention to where the tip of your tongue is. Now, in English, for d, the tip of the tongue is at the ridge just behind the teeth, the so-called alveolar ridge. And then you can try to contrast that with d, d, the so-called retroflex d. So you try out these minimal contrasts, just varying one thing at the same time. And incidentally, of course, it may same sense, makes sense for vowels. And it's also useful to practice this with vowels. Let me just illustrate this uh, for vowels. So you pronounce E, which is a vowel sound in English, right? Start with E. Notice that the lips are spread, E. And then gradually around your lips, what will happen? E, right? Now this is useful because you can actually see what happens with the lip movement. So it's something you can practice looking at yourselves in the mirror and try to keep from laughing because it may look a bit funny. But so you can practice this kind of thing and that, as I said, will expand your potential. But in biological terms, in terms of the human body, this also includes auditory phonetics. So the sort of phonetics of how we perceive the sounds. And here similarly there is a sort of sense of phonetic yoga. What is that? Well, it's learning to distinguish contrast in sound. On the one hand, of course, the ones you're familiar with from the language you speak. Okay? or the language your students, your pupils speak. But on the other hand, distinctions that are part of the human sort of auditory potential, but, an, but distinctions that are not use, utilized in the languages your students speak. Okay? So this is important. Uh, and then, of course, you can think about in t social terms. What do these pronunciations mean in social terms? And this is where the meaning in social terms of the different accents come in. Uh, and you have to think about what does it mean to sound like an Indian English speaker of, uh, of English from uh, here from, from AP, for example, or from UP, or from Marissa and so on. And you all know that you can locate Indian speakers of English in regions. And you also know you can locate speakers of, of say, British English, of Singaporean English, and so on. But you also know that the accent, the pronunciation, says something about where people are in terms of class. Okay? So the Queen's English or received pronunciation, RP English and so on, all these relate to the sort of social recognition of different ways of pronouncing sounds. Uh, but then finally, of course, we can also look at consonants in terms of the system of language, the meaning-making system, the semiotic system itself. And this is the highest level. And that is, of course, looking at the sounds in terms of the sounding system or in technical terms, the phonological system of the language. So you can think about the sound system of English, the phonology of English, and mapping that to the articulation, the way you perceive sounds, the acoustics, and so on. So we'll look at this just in acoustic terms, right? Well, pass the tartar -ta sauce. All right, I think you, you've uh, memorized it now. Now, if you look at this display, 
Uh, this is for, from a system for analyzing sound in terms of its acoustic properties. The system is Prat, P-R-A-A-T. I think it's related to prattle and prate in dialects of English. Now, if you look at the lowest uh, display on, on, on the slide here, you will see that you have these pa uh, parts, the bands as it were, where you have fairly clear indication of darker patterns. These are the vowels, right? So in the sound stream, these are the vowels where you have a fairly open uh, air stream. So again, if you take something like la, la, da, da, pa, pa, ba, ba, right? Then the R here, this is where you have the clear uh, so-called formants, the clear indications of patterns of uh, our frequency. And when they're interrupted, this is where you get the consonants. So pass, for example, or Ruth, right? You see you have a clear uh, passage and then you have the interruption in terms of a consonant where you stop the airstream altogether or you constrict it so you get friction like stopping, uh, for example, ta, ta, right? Or restricting as in pass, right? All these show up in the acoustics. So it's useful if you're studying sound and you're trying to explain this to your students even to have this kind of uh, what one might call visual feedback. It helps you in listening, so it helps you in, in, in the perception of the sound if you're able to see what happens. Okay? So a system like Prat can be useful in studying consonants, vowels, and, uh, but also intonation and other things. Well, pass the tartar sauce. So this is just blowing it up a bit. Now, so in terms of phonetics then, you have articulatory phonetics, auditory phonetics, and articulatory phonetics is a matter of postural choices. Now let me say a little bit more about postural choices and relating this to what I was talking about before, phonetic yoga. So take something like Ruth, Pasa Tata Sos, our example. Now you look at this very schematic representation of uh, the human body, a part of the human body. So you can look at this like that and this schematic representation. Now this comes from a very nice resource that is available on the web that you can try out yourselves and you'll get the URL. And this is a pronunciation of th in Ruth. So you can experiment with this and get a sense of what's happening and this can help you explain to your students, right? So when you look at this on the web, you will get a movement of the articulators. And you can relate this to all the things you're doing with the sounds. So if you take something like Ruth, right? It's a matter of what you do with your lips, with the place of the tongue, voicing, and the manner of articulation with the pan, tongue. And all these are involved in the complex uh, pronunciation of Ruth. Okay? So they all have particular choices that you make. So spread lips in Ruth, right? Uh, uh, a dental uh, location, uh, if it's, uh, it's, this is unvoiced, it's fricative, it's oral rather than nasal, and all the rest. So, going back to Ruth, right, uh, then you can look at this and you can see how th comes in after the vowel and you get a sense of the contribution of the consonant in the whole pronunciation. Now, what I recommend is then trying out all these different dimensions. Now, in the unit on this, you have a good inventory of the consonants of English, right, and the listing with exemplification of words with some contrast in, in Hindi Urdu, so you can try this out. But what I think is useful is to see one thing at a time, one dimension at a time, vary this and get a sense of how you can help your students listening but also articulating. So the consonants in English then, they're part of the overall resources for making sounds in English. Okay? Uh, and I think that's the most important aspect of the whole uh, of, of the whole uh, lesson is getting a sense of one's own body, right? One's own body as a resource in making sounds and you make sounds precisely, of course, to express meanings. And what you want to help your students with, what you want to empower your students to do, of course, is listen, perceive the sounds of English and then also reprodu to reproduce them as accurately as possible choosing, of course, a model that is uh, useful to them. So you want to raise their consciousness, you want to sensitize them to the consonants. 
But the best way of doing that is to take some text, like a nursery rhyme, for example, and get a sense of how do the consonants contribute to this. Or if you have a favorite poem, you can pick out the consonants for, for them, and you can get them to attend to the consonants and uh, learn to distinguish the consonants. You can play this to them, and then you can ask them to transcribe it. And in this way, you build up their consciousness. You raise their consciousness of the consonants. And the more they're able to monitor their, monitor their own production of consonants, the better they will be at correcting them and adjusting them. This has been Christian Matheson, Department of Linguistics, Macquarie University. For your suggestions, your ideas, feedback, etc., write the director at the Directorate of Distance Education, Maulana Azad National Urdu University, Gachibali, Hyderabad, 500032. Thank you. Mm -hmm.